This is Cambodia, a country of impenetrable jungles and fabulous ruins lost in time, where kings became gods and monks still seek heavenly peace. And now this mysterious land has begun to open up to reveal the dark beauty that has lured adventurers here for centuries. My journey will take me deep into its exotic heart, where landmines still kill and the soldiers of the Khmer Rouge still patrol the remote jungles, as I try to discover how such a peaceful country could become the killing fields. My name is David Adams, and this is the deep jungle of the Cardamon Mountains in southern Cambodia. Now, for more than 30 years, this wilderness has been cut off from the outside world, and for much of that time, it's been a Khmer Rouge stronghold. This primeval rainforest is one of Southeast Asia's last wilderness areas, which until recently, you entered at your own risk. These impenetrable forests were once a refuge for guerrilla fighters, but they were also a refuge for an incredible array of unique wildlife. My journey starts on the Thai border. From there, I head across Ton Le Sap, Cambodia's Great Lake, then north into the wilderness before heading down the mighty Mekong to the capital, Phnom Penh, and then finally onto the jungles of the Cardamans. For 30 years, Cambodia's history has been one of suffering, as it was bombed, blasted and brutalised by war. France, the United States and Vietnam all playing their part. But its greatest misery came from within. In 1975, Cambodia came under the control of a radical communist government, the Khmer Rouge. But today, there's another side to the Khmer Rouge. I'm with a band of former jungle soldiers who are setting up an ambush. But the quarry is no longer human. This time, their weapons are cameras and their targets, rare and endangered wildlife. In a way, both soldiers and animals became allies. While the Khmer Rouge hunted the wildlife, they also kept everyone else out of the jungles which preserved the habitat of a huge number of endangered species. This dusty and polluted town on the Thai-Cambodia border is called Hoi Pet. Only a few months ago, it harbored one of the most notorious rare animal markets in Asia. To enter this illicit world, I need people who have access, experienced guides who know their way around the jungles and the former domain of the Khmer Rouge. But now I see it's the only one that I... Sun Hien and Hunter Weiler were just the guys. In their work for the Cambodian Wildlife Protection Office, both travelled deep into Cambodia's wildest regions. If they had their way, so a shop like this would be closed down. One way of saving endangered animals is to stop the illicit trade in rare animal parts. What one's this? This is an uh, Indochina subspecies of the tiger. This is quite small. Yeah, somewhat smaller than the Bengal tiger. And what are these? These are clouded leopard, also uh, an endangered species. They spend a lot of time up in the trees hunting birds. There are also parts of animals, bantang and rhinoceros horns, crocodile skulls and tiger penises, skins, bladders and beaks. 
all valued as ingredients in Eastern traditional medicines. Then there are the trophy horns and antlers. These too may be ground up for use in making love potions. These are cupre. The cupre is the national animal of Cambodia. It's maybe totally extinct from the face of the earth. And it's here for the first time that I see the horns of a rare, perhaps even mythical creature, the Keating vor. It's said to be a shy animal that eats snakes, and its horn is supposed to be an antidote for snake bite. It's also sometimes known as the Cambodian unicorn, despite having two horns. Has he, um, has he ever seen one of these horns? Mean the alive animal? Alive animal? Oh, that you can't get into a cool sack roof there, I think one. He's never seen a live animal. Mythology tells us that the unicorn came from the east. Like the Keating vor, its horn was supposed to be a cure for poison and was such a demand for traditional medicine. It's no surprise to learn that counterfeiters have moved in. And are these real ones? Oh. About 90% of people say it's King War. What do you think, Hannah? Well, I don't know. I'm skeptical about this one. Of all the kidding boar horns that scientists have examined, most of them turn out to be fakes. There is a very large counterfeit market because of the scarcity of the animal and its high monetary value. So what price would he sell these for? The most expensive horn that he sells is like 200 US dollar per horn. Per horn? So, yeah. 200 dollars for this? Yes, yes. For, for a here. subsistence farmer, that's more than a year's wages. I can't help wondering if there's a mythical scam happening here. Yeah, I have a friend here and uh, he's trying to draw a dig wall. In an effort to convince me, Sun Hien takes me to meet an artist friend who can give me some idea of what this Cambodian unicorn looks like. <laughs> On the wall, I see a poster of rare and endangered animals. Amongst them, a Keating vor. Let's just call it a two-horned unicorn so we know where we are. This is one of his references. The other is a set of horns, but knowing how many fake horns there are, maybe he also needs a little imagination. Gradually, an animal takes shape in a setting that looks like a Garden of Eden, with one difference. The snake gets eaten by the two-horned unicorn. So do you think it exists in the jungle somewhere? Yeah, he said but, it, yeah, absolutely exists in the yeah. jungle today, yeah. Both Sun Hien and Hunter are driven by a passion to protect endangered animals. For me, the chance of photographing a mythical creature, however remote, is reason enough to join their expedition. I mean, it's almost a legend about this, this animal. A unicorn is a mythical beast with a very strange and distinct horn yeah. that lives in the hearts and minds of some ancient peoples. Uh, it's maybe like Cambodia's unicorn, only in this case, this unicorn may actually exist. I think so. But they've never brought any body or skins or anything like that, so it's... It's very hard to believe in some ways. Yeah, but <laughs> we didn't know. We're not sure about that yet. Because uh, the, the animal... The... One thing we do know, though, our next stop was once the greatest city on the planet, an earthly paradise that lay lost in the jungle for 500 years. Cambodia is a strange mixture of Southeast Asian and European culture. The icons of the ancient Khmer Empire rubbing shoulders with French colonial architecture. It was once part of French Indochina, but long before the French occupation, Cambodia was at the center of a great empire that once boasted the greatest city on earth. We're in the town of Battenbang to pick up a boat to take us to the ruined city of Angkor.
Since so much of Cambodia is traversed by rivers and canals, a boat is often the most efficient form of transport. It's here you see another side to Cambodia, mile after mile of river communities. All along the banks are houseboats and floating villages, mostly subsistence fishermen. Proximity to Tonle Sap and its ready supply of fish were major reasons for the successful expansion of Angkor, though today overfishing is threatening this great resource. And it's not for the first time. When these amazing ruins were first rescued from the jungle, the world marvelled at the lost capital of an ancient empire. From here, between the 9th and the 13th centuries, the Khmer emperors ruled virtually all of Southeast Asia. This is what the tourists see, the great Angkor Wat temple. What's not so well known is that Angkor city sprawled over a thousand square kilometers, or 600 square miles. In its day, it was the largest city on Earth. It's actually like a great low-density industrial city, sort of Los Angeles. So what's, what sort Sprawling. of population are we talking about? Uh, the general estimates are somewhere on the order of a million within this thousand square k. Meet Professor Roland Fletcher, an Australian archaeologist who has spent years studying large cities of the ancient world. And how, how does that compare to, say, Paris or London at the same time? Paris or London at that period were uh, a couple of hundred thousand or less. So they're very small places, very wow. small indeed. So how far does it actually go beyond the tree line there? I oh, know, it extends to the hills on the northern horizon, literally the horizon. All the way around? All the way around. It's absolutely amazing. Over there, that's... I'm just getting used to this ancient sprawl like. when Professor Fletcher produces a radar map taken from this the space a, shuttle. A radar, taken radar taken penetrates the jungle revealing a vast network of ruined roads, suburbs and canals. The colours turning hidden ruins into a skeletal record of civilization. That's the West Barai, which is eight kilometres. That's the big reservoir out here. That's the one over there. Right. And the bit I'm really interested in is this huge road that runs up for 25 kilometres up to the Kalen Hills, which is up to that uh, high point on the hills. And the point of all this? Well, something went wrong. Even though it was the capital of a mighty empire situated in a green and fertile land, it died. Professor Fletcher thinks he knows why. Well, the reason I'm interested in it is because it's the largest pre-industrial, low-density city. And there are a lot of problems about why those low-density cities die. Because this is the biggest example, this is the key test. And at the moment, our suspicion is that it's an ecological problem. It's to do with excessive land clearance. Under all these trees, and in fact off beyond the horizon, there are Anchorean period fields under the forests. So this whole area would have actually been just paddy field plains? Right, with, with trees where the houses are along the streets, like you see in modern villages. Part of this history here may be being rerun, and that's what we want to assess. They felled the trees, overfished the lake, and eventually ran out of food, population, and purpose. Professor Fletcher believes this architectural time capsule sends out a warning to the world. It was the Los Angeles, the Mexico City, or the London of its day, and it died. Yet ecologically, the same mistakes he believes brought about its demise are being repeated again, right now. The question is, if it happened once, could it happen again? But far more recently, 
Cambodia experienced an even greater cataclysm. We're about to enter the last bastion of the Khmer Rouge and the final resting place of one of the world's bloodiest killers. In 1928, a boy was born to a peasant family in Cambodia. For six years, he lived and studied peacefully in a Buddhist monastery, two of them as a monk. Later, he went to study in Paris. His name was Solat Sar, but he was better known to the world as Pol Pot, and he became a killer. How such a peaceful country could end up with such a brutal killer as its leader has always been a source of amazement to me. We're in the far north of Cambodia, heading for the tiny township of An Long Veng on our way to the Mekong River. Few people on earth have unleashed such chaos as Pol Pot. In 1975, he sent the Khmer Rouge into Phnom Penh to empty it. It was part of an experiment to set up an ideal peasant state. They marched the population into the fields to work and cut Cambodia off from the world. They began again with year zero. Temples, money and property were abolished. And the purge that followed gave us the phrase, the killing fields. It's estimated 1.5 million people died in Pol Pot's extermination camps. As we get closer, I feel a sense of apprehension. Already, there are signs of war. A lot of people died on this road. Basically, everyone who lives here is an ex Khmer Rouge uh, soldier or a member of their families. And this area was the last stronghold of the Khmer Rouge movement. This is where Paul Pot had his headquarters, and this was the last Khmer Rouge bastion to fall in all of Cambodia. Yeah. Are we going to get through okay, or is it difficulties with the, with the government troops? Oh, I think now it's okay. Uh, we just talk with the soldier here. At a checkpoint, we offer a small gift. It's not a bribe, it's a courtesy. And it can mean a lot to a man who only earns $20 a month. Well, this is the first checkpoint into what, what was and probably still is the, the heartland of the Khmer Rouge. And up here on this mountain is where Pol Pot died. Now, whether he was murdered or whether he died of old age is still open to conjecture. But his body and all the remains of it are still up here. And uh, very few people still have been allowed in here. And uh, even though it's now part of government territory, it's still very much Khmer Rouge. The echoes of war are everywhere. Derelict and rusting tanks are reminders of the Khmer Rouge's last stand. And then another checkpoint. It's the entrance to Pol Pot's headquarters. More soldiers to negotiate with. And again, there are signs of fighting. These statues are revolutionaries and they've all had their heads blown off. Hello? Hi. We approach the soldiers cautiously. Even though they wear the insignia of the modern Cambodian army, these men were Khmer Rouge guards in Pol Pot's day. Yeah. He says he's a Khmer Rouge, ex Khmer Rouge uh -huh. soldier. Did he like Pol Pot? Did he think he was a hero? <laughs> He said, anybody is like. Everybody liked him? Yeah. Why did so many people like him? Because he was a 
Yeah. Uh, he help. said uh, it forced, forced him. They forced? Yeah. They forced him to like him? Yeah. So most people didn't want to like him? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's all a little unclear what he believed or believes. The days of the Khmer Rouge are not long gone. Just in case there's trouble ahead, Sun Hien arranges for one of the soldiers to come with us to ease our passage. The road gets worse. So after the deaths of 1.5 million people, how could someone still like Pol Pot? I think a lot of people actually liked Pol Pot because he was such a, a fierce mm, that what I heard dictator. From, yeah, that what I heard from other people individually, you know, they, they still, you know, respect Pol Pot. Despite yeah. him killing all those people, and they're, they're even some of their own relatives, they still respect him. That's incredible. There's a sense of dread as we arrive at Pravi here, Pol Pot's last headquarters. This was where he died. Hello. <laughs> the greeting, though, is friendly. This is a real government soldier, Hello. not a former Khmer Rouge. Uh, Border sensitivities have changed, and today it's the government in charge. I understand that Pol Pot's last days were spent here and that he died here mm -hmm. and his body was burnt. Is that correct? Uh, he died here and his body was burned in that place. Could, could he show us? There's not much left of it, is there? At first, it all looks a bit mundane. A scattering of Pol Pot's possessions, even the remains of his toilet. And then we're shown his grave. Uh, that is the uh, place that they burned Pol Pot's body after he died. So it, nothing's been removed, it's just the ashes of Pol Pot here? They piled up his possessions, put his body on the funeral pyre, and burnt the lot. Hardly a state funeral. It's kind of an ignominious ending for one of the great butchers of history. Between one and two million people controlled all of Cambodia at one time. Mm. This is Pol Pot's monument for <laughs> posterity. Not too impressive, but probably fitting. Yeah, very much, very much. Millions of deaths, endless suffering, and all that's left is a dirty mound and a broken toilet in a jungle clearing. Even so, the soldiers still speak in hushed tones at his graveside. The memory of Pol Pot and the killing fields still has a profound effect on the Cambodian people. As they pick over what remains of his funeral pyre, I notice incense sticks. Buddhist offerings on the grave of a communist who despised religion. A day's drive from Pol Pot's grave is the reason Hunter Weiler and Son Hien have come to this remote part of the jungle. They're meeting up with some former Khmer Rouge soldiers who've become professional wildlife trackers. And they're on the trail of the Keating Boar. Cambodia's semi-legendary two-horned unicorn. These guys are some of the most skillful wildlife hunters in Cambodia. Today, they're working for the Wildlife Conservation Society, an organization that's changing the way locals view the jungle and the animals in it. We've recruited the best of the former hunters and turned them into wildlife rangers. And the people we've recruited, I would say probably 80% of the tigers are killed by 25% of the hunters. There's a sort of elite that specializes in large mammals. And these are the people we've gone after. So we've taken out of circulation in this province 10 of the very best hunters. And each of those hunters is capable of killing several tiger a year. So that's a dramatic impact to take that many experienced that's hunters right, out yeah. of circulation and get them on the side of conservation. Yeah. So here, the stories come together. Khmer Rouge and endangered wildlife. 
and together the possibility of a bright future for this beleaguered land. So have they, have they had much luck recently? The for their efforts, again. the They've cameras are beginning luck. to reveal what lies beneath the canopy. Mm -hmm. And from this province we have tiger, gower and banting, two endangered wild cattle, sambar deer, barking deer, and giant ibis bird. And um, any sign of kidding ball? Not yet. <laughs> We're hoping. <Yeah. laughs> As we walk back, we stick strictly to the path. Thanks to the Khmer Rouge, Cambodia is one of the most heavily landmined countries on Earth. Six million of them are still scattered across the country. One false step, and you can lose your leg, or worse. Every day somewhere in Cambodia, a landmine explodes under someone. Every single person who lives in this village has either stood on a mine or is related to a victim. They're all here because of this remarkable man, Bud Gibbons. He's a Vietnam vet who decided to return to Indochina to try and help those maimed by landmines. He couldn't do much about the landmines, but he could try and help the victims put their lives back together afterwards. So he started a factory to make low-cost artificial limbs. It's time to pay back, you know. It's time to pay back for what I did and what we were part of in, in the past, and also to share, to share some of the incredible wealth and the incredible knowledge that we as Americans have. Everyone working here is missing a limb or has been severely maimed. But Bud soon realized that providing the limbs wasn't enough. In Cambodia, such victims are usually shunned as unemployable, unmarriageable, and generally a burden on society. If his scheme was to work, he had to do more. Learning how to use the limb is no problem. One, two weeks, we do give them training, how to walk, how to balance, that kind of thing. Then they go back to their village. That is where I think the problem is, because they can't find a way to support themselves financially or economically. They are now supporting themselves mechanically with this limb, but they have no job. So they need to have some way to get money. So Bud and his landmine victims started a silk industry. And it's good silk, commanding high prices. And it's all made by the maimed and the limbless. They grow their own mulberries to feed to their own silkworms. Then they spin it, dye it, weave it, and market it to the world on the internet. What it's done is give them back their self-respect. With the money they earned, they bought land and they built homes. Many have married and now educate their children in the school they built themselves. And now, they even pass on their skills to those that have limbs. And much of it is due to the drive and enterprise of a former GI. In such an impoverished society, it's amazing what hope and support can achieve, especially when they've been dealt such a cruel blow by war. I leave the village feeling both uplifted and humbled, but we must move on. The Mekong River is home to pirates. Since the end of the war, attacks on boats have increased steadily. Tomorrow, we run the gauntlet of these modern-day buccaneers on one of the most dangerous sections of the river. The Mekong is 2,700 miles long. That's 4,300 kilometers, which makes it one of the longest rivers in the world. Oh, 
From here, it's a 200-mile journey to Phnom Penh, a journey the government advises all Westerners against because of banditry and piracy. Wildlife protection officers Hunter and Sun Hien have made the journey many times though. The jungles that line the banks are a rich source of wildlife for the poachers that they're trying to wipe out. At first, the river appears as a vast drifting lake, but it's not as serene as it seems. This river is a navigator's nightmare. The crew place a bowl of fruit on the bow, an offering to the river spirits to ensure that the passage goes well. So these rapids all down the Mekong, are they? Yeah, they have several of them, you know, yeah. on the way from Tung Tran to Pachis. I think that is one of the small, smaller one, not the biggest one. Soon the waters start to ripple, then simmer, and whirlpools, rips and currents erupt. Right about now, I'm glad that these are the small rapids. Stone buoys, put in place by the French a century ago, mark the course. The helmsman must apply just the right amount of power on the rudder, or the boat will be ripped apart by the rocks below. For a moment, even the captain casts a concerned eye but just for a moment. He has total faith in his helmsman, his son, and I guess so should I. Rapids and shallows make travel on the Mekong dangerous after dark, not forgetting pirates. So we look for somewhere to rest up for the night. Sailing on this river is very much a family affair. Living aboard is the captain's wife, his mother-in-law, his sons, their wives, and a new member of the crew, his grandson. No doubt he too will one day captain on the Mekong. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you this is delicious. Mm. Sort of a peanut. Oh. Peanut and meat and garlic, and this is like a sweet rice. They just bundle it up together with um, banana leaves. Keeps it lovely and fresh. Really good, isn't it? <laughs> Need like a king on the Mekong. <laughs> Mekong River water isn't quite the purest on earth, but after a hot day, it's got to be the most refreshing. And as the sound of singing reaches out to us across these waters, again I wonder how such a peaceful country could have suffered so much. As day breaks, fishermen are returning from a night's work, and the river glows rich and golden as we slip our moorings and prepare to continue our voyage. And for me, no chance of a sleep in. The revving engine soon sees to that. Well, I wouldn't say that's the best night's sleep I've ever had. Uh, a lot of muzzies and really sticky. But now it's beautifully cool. I have to say it's an incredibly peaceful place. You know, in the Mekong you expect this incredibly crowded river seething with humanity, but there's nothing. It's just jungle and really beautiful. However, this wilderness has remained not because of a desire for preservation. It's remained simply because civil unrest meant that no one could safely live here. 
a no man's land of opportunity for pirates, bandits and renegade units of the Khmer Rouge. We said when they stop the boat, they shot the gun, and then when we get in, they get all the people up to the jungle, and then those people come into the boat and they check and see everyone, everything they want, they took away. He tells me that a few shots over the bow from the jungle would announce the attackers. It happened so often that once he had to cover his boat with armor plating. Our conversation ends as we approach River Shallows. They check the depth, but again, no one's really that concerned. They've all been this way many times before. But then the wilderness disappears, and on the banks, another brand of piracy illegal loggers, felling the great forests in a desperate attempt to earn dollars in a cash-strapped country. But spending the inheritance is what happens when order breaks down and a country is pulled apart by war, greed and opportunism. And when war came to Phnom Penh, it wasn't just a city devastated by bombs. It was an empty city, cleared by the Khmer Rouge, who'd forced everyone out at gunpoint. So it's with some relief that I find a vibrant, busy city. And it's here that I meet Chit, one of Cambodia's leading journalists. And I couldn't have hoped for a better guide. The lovely thing about Phnom Penh is that it's a really small town. Despite a bit of traffic, you can get around easily by motorbike. There's cafes everywhere, and then this wonderful architecture left by the French. It's a really lovely city. So is that, is that the palace? Yes, it is. Even this most Cambodian of structures yeah. was built by the French. So what happened next? Well, Hunter is a relatively recent arrival in newly peaceful Phnom Penh. Over lunch at his house, I learn about Chiat's Khmer Rouge past. I married during the Khmer Rouge time. I got married, yeah. Khmer Rouge forced me to marry. But you're not, not with your wife anymore? Yeah, but I could not say no. Yeah. If I say no, I would be headed or disappeared. Yeah, but you're a survivor. Yes, I'm a <laughs> I'm like a cat. <laughs> and people did disappear, millions of them. To bring me face to face with the demons of Cambodia's past, Chiat takes me to Tol Sleng, now known as the Museum of Genocide. Tol Sleng was once a high school, but the Khmer Rouge turned it into a torture chamber. Here they interrogated anyone who they considered to be an enemy of the state, which seemed to be just about everyone. How many people were killed here? How many people died? It's more than 20,000 people. 20,000? Yeah, died in this, uh, in this prison. And they just brought them in and tortured them? Tortured and then sent them to Chiang Ai and killed them. Which were the killing fields? Yeah, a million people got killed over there. The quiet is unsettling. As we step further into this dreadful place, Morbid fascination is overtaken by horror. This wasn't just a place where people died, it was a place where they died horribly. What a horrible place. Yeah, horrible. Was it a map of Cambodia? It's a map of Cambodia. Pretty macabre, isn't it? Yes, it is. They were intellectual and farmer. And they made a map of them? Yeah. My God. The tragedy can be seen in their faces, victims and victors side by side. Those of the Khmer Rouge, defiant and arrogant. Those of the victims, simply defeated.
it's impossible not to be moved by the unspeakable suffering and brutality that took place here. As we walk, I wonder how any ideology or hatred could ever justify such evil. For Chiat, it must be particularly confronting. You know, I feel sad and reminded in the past day when I see this picture. Yeah? yeah. It's, it's yeah, just like unbelievable. Yeah. So it reminds me the, the day in the past about Khmer Rulai, starving, uh, fearing. What do you think about that? I've, I've just never seen anything like it. The Holocaust in Germany must be similar. But similar, yeah. I, I just, I haven't seen that, so this is, I've never seen anything like it. And you managed to live through this. Try to, you know, to live in this uh, through this region. I think you're lucky to be alive. Let's go and get a help me. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go and get a drink. Okay. In spite of all they've been through, or perhaps because of it. Whenever Cambodians get a chance, they party like there's no tomorrow. And karaoke is the urban entertainment of choice. When they sing, they do so without a shred of embarrassment, which is sometimes a good thing. And sometimes not, particularly when it's my turn. It's hard to believe that not long ago the entire population of Phnom Penh was forcibly relocated, leaving the city empty. Tomorrow, I too must leave the city as I head into the last of Southeast Asia's great wilderness areas, the Cardamom Mountains. Southeast Asia's monsoons were heavy this year in Cambodia's Cardamom Mountains, and few of the roads survived. So we resort to a hangover from the communist days, a Russian-built six-wheel drive. And it's like riding an angry elephant. You know, these, uh, these bridges washed out every year. Yes, every year. So they have to keep rebuild them each time. Yeah. Yeah. That's the worst road I've ever been on, I think. My travelling companions from the Wildlife Protection Office, Hunter Weiler and Sun Hien, have invited local journalist Chiat to join us so he can witness firsthand what's happening in the cardamoms. Once more, we're heading into the Khmer Rouge's former territory. It wasn't far from here that Chiat was stationed when he was a Khmer Rouge soldier. Nearly everyone who lives here was once in the Khmer Rouge. This was where their rule lasted longest. It is the remotest and wildest corner of Southeast Asia. The Cardamom Mountains are on Cambodia's southern coast, and they're one of Southeast Asia's last wilderness areas. Our destination is the remote village of Osam. The cardamoms are covered with thick tropical rainforest, which is full of wildlife. This is what Cambodia would have looked like before land clearance and mass exploitation of forests. Ironically, if the country had remained under the Khmer Rouge, the loggers would have been kept at bay. Is this illegal? You know, people cut, cutting tree down very fast, and they are moving into the jungle and blowing up the elephant and tiger. So I'm afraid it will be 
all the tree and animal will be gone in the next three years or two years if two the government three years. Yeah, if the government do not have any action to stop this kind of activity. And it's not just loggers. In the last couple of years, some 5,000 refugees have moved in. They want land, so they slash and burn the jungle. This is the village of Osam. If the Khmer Rouge had had their way, all of Cambodia would have been like Osam. To them, it was the ideal community. There was no money, no organized religion. It was free of intellectuals and decadence. To the Khmer Rouge, this was a peasant communist utopia. <laughs> The Osam village elders are animists. They worship the spirits of the forest. The Khmer Rouge tolerated these beliefs as they posed no threat. But their isolation and their simple, uncomplicated lifestyle is coming to an end. The cardamans are about to be caught in a pincer movement. On one side, the forces of exploitation as the loggers denude the forests. On the other side, the forces of ignorance as the refugees slash and burn. For Hunter and Sun Hien, it's a race against time. They must find out what animals live in these jungles. Otherwise, they can't mount an argument for their preservation. For them, the camera traps are the key, providing hard evidence that this wilderness should be preserved. Thankfully, they're already finding a treasure trove of rare animals. Our cameras snap Southeast Asian wild cattle, samba deer, clouded leopards, and a rare Indochina tiger. But alas, no two-horned unicorn, the elusive Keating Vore. Though, if it exists anywhere, it'll be here in the Cardamon Mountains. Even skilled hunters who spend years in the forest only encounter one of these animals maybe once every five, seven, ten years. It's usually once or twice in a lifetime encounter from what we've been able to learn. Tusseret himself has never seen one, and he's spent over 15 years in the forest, 12 years as a Khmer Rouge gorilla, as a hunter for the gorilla, supplying meat. So he's one of the most skilled hunters from Cambodia, and he, in the cardamoms, 12 years in the forest, he's never seen a kidding boar. So I guess if the kidding boar is here or not, it, it's academic, because this forest actually might not be here in five years' time. That's why we're all working so hard to establish a new protected forest in this area, exempt from logging, to preserve the species we know about, and probably other unknown species. Maybe not as big and glamorous as the kidding boar, but surveys from the last year have turned up new species of snakes, butterflies, moths. This is a biodiversity treasure house, and we do need to inventory it thoroughly, and we need to preserve what we have. In a small shrine, I find a monk giving blessings for all who enter. And I can't help but leave a prayer of hope on the ancient altar. It's too late to stop the killing fields. And probably it's too late to save the snake-eating two-horned unicorn. But it's not too late to stop the destruction in the Cardamon Mountains. And it's not too late to prevent Cambodia's other endangered wildlife following the Keating Vore. It's also not too late to consider the lessons of ancient Angkor, though next time there may not be any trees left to take their revenge here at the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm.